Welcome to the Free Thought Matters After Party. I'm Andrew Seidel. I'm still filling in for hosting, and I am still interviewing Dr. Andrew Whitehead and Dr. Sam Perry, authors of the amazing book, Taking America Back for God. Uh, you can check out the full interview, but now we're going to get into some of the, the more of the nitty gritty, more of the fun stuff. One of the things that I love about science and really the scholarly pursuit of knowledge is that it admits when it's wrong and it acknowledges its limitations. And I think you guys did that in your book and you did that in your article. What are some of the limitations on the data and on the conclusions that we should be drawing? Basically, what's the grain of salt that everybody needs to be taking with all this great information? That's that's a great question. And I think sometimes it can be easy for us as social scientists to want to, um, you know, get so into this and really push forward all of these things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think for us, when we ask these types of questions of Americans and large national samples, um, we're trying to be as representative as we can so we can generalize. But I think um, what we you know, hope to do more of ourselves, but we hope other researchers do as well, is to really look at Christian nationalism um, in different racial and ethnic groups. Because we're starting to, again, as we shared in the uh, main interview, pull out how it operates differently for black Americans versus white. But there are other racial groups and even um, doing more interviews within them to really see how is this operating? What does this cultural framework mean? Um, and is it something different among these groups? I think that is something that we weren't able to do in the book, um, but that we hope to continue to do. And, and again, we hope our colleagues um, will, you know, with uh, specializations in those areas, will will be able to do as well. And certainly more poignant now. And I mean, and we, did, we, we touched about this a little bit with the Mississippi flag, but that, that really was fascinating where you, you wrote about how for white Mississippians, in God we trust on the flag just means something completely different than it does for black Mississippians. It's, it's just so fascinating to see that. Yeah, and I think that's where the interviewing would really help pull that out. Because even in some of the news stories, you could see um, African-American pastors or preachers or clergy people saying how they were excited that In God We Trust was on there. But even in their comments, they would say, but we know it means something for us that's different maybe for whites. And I mean, just thinking too about, um, you know, the, the slaveholders Bible where they cut out Exodus and really any sort of Bible story about freedom mm -hmm. um, or slaves being set free. And, and you can think about in God we trust for African Americans or, or former slaves, that was key. And so in God we trust meant something very different for them in their Christianity than it did for whites who were trying to, again, maintain power and control. Yeah, fascinating. I can't wait to see what you guys do on that. One thing I was curious about when I was reading this was how far back does this version of Christian nationalism that you're studying go back? I mean, we know about the rise of the religious right. We know the moral majority and that it claims its origins in Roe versus Wade, but that it's really probably more in the desegregation area uh, era. Is this the same political beast? Is this something new? Does it go back even farther? Uh, or is that something you didn't really get enough of a chance to look at? Uh, so we, we weren't able to pick at this much in the book. We tried to stick with contemporary uh, Christian nationalism as we could measure it in surveys and, and, and look at it in interviews. And, and there have been a, a lot of uh, wonderful histories of religious nationalism in the United States. Uh, yours, one of those included. And so, um, uh, I would argue that uh, the kind of racialized Christian nationalism that we're describing um, isn't necessarily a part and parcel that I would connect with the founding fathers. I think that's really important to Christian nationalists that it is. Uh, like Robert Jeffers uh, just gave a, a, a message last night, rehashed a, a message last night about America is a Christian nation. And what he wanted to demonstrate is that the founding fathers were Christians like I'm a Christian, and they, they talk like me and, and value the things that I value, and we should make sure that nobody can take it from us. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's connected to how the Founding Fathers saw religion's relationship in the United States at all, uh, if you do any digging. But I, I do feel like you see the kind of Christian nationalism we're talking about emerge on the scene in the early 1800s when it becomes explicitly connected to America's identity vis-a-vis -vis other nations. And so what are we like when well, we are this uh, uh, native-born, ethnically white Christian in this evangelical sense kind of nation, and that ties all of our identities together. And so as America was trying to, to unite around a common core set of this is what makes us us, I think that's when you start to see Christianity 
racialized and connected to all of these other things in comparison to these other nations. And I think, as I was saying earlier, I think it carries on and you see uh, it intensified and heightened during times of cultural threat, where this group feels like we need to marshal and rally around this common identity and Christianity just being this single part of that identity around these other kind of ethnic markers of native born status and whiteness and uh, maleness, masculinity, certainly. Well, and, you, and you mentioned the other countries and we have seen that rise of religious nationalism around the world in the past three, four, five years. Are, are you seeing similarities and differences? Uh, and you know, I know the book is limited really to, to the United States, but uh, you, you must have run over some uh, and have some idea of the similarities and differences between the different countries that are seeing this rise of nationalism, religious nationalism. Yeah, I think in some ways, you know, you could see some of the mechanisms operating similarly. But again, the U.S. stands a little bit as an outlier just because the religion that was so dominant from the beginning really revolved around this kind of evangelical identity and was really influential through the the uh, first and second great awakenings. And then, um, as Sam explained, you know, in the 1800s and then through today. And so that does kind of set it apart, makes it somewhat different. But there are some political scientists doing great work where more comparative studies. And even in Europe, as we see some of the um, nationalism rise there and populism, there's a religious aspect, but there too, it, it, it operates slightly differently because of what Chris, Christianity or Christendom means there versus here, for sure. So one final, well, two final things. One, we, di we didn't get to really talk about Christian nationalist views on atheists at all, but that's something that you do cover kind of in depth in the book that I found really, really interesting. Um, and this was, I, I believe this was another area where the dichotomy between religiosity and Christian nationalists was also pretty obvious. Uh, how do Christian nationalists see non-religious Americans, atheists, agnostics, whatever term they use to apply to themselves? Right. Uh, I think um, what we show in the book and what we find is that uh, they, with an, with an irrational fear of, <laughs> of, uh, of threat, and, and when I say that, I mean, I think you, you could see, you could certainly see Christian nationalists being fearful that atheists or agnostics, secular Americans generally want to change the culture and don't value the things that Christian nationalists value. You, you, would, you would assume such a thing. But when we ask questions about whether uh, Christian nationalists feel like, or Americans feel like, atheists want to take away their rights, the rights of, uh, of, of people like them, or whether they want to do them physical harm. That was a shocker, is that we, we actually find that getting close to 50% of people who are higher on Christian nationalism, that ambassador category, feel like atheists literally want to do them physical harm. I mean, uh, I, and so, that was so striking. I, the, the take away our rights, but also that they actually want to be violent towards us. And they're, they're legitimately concerned about this. Right, absolutely. And, so, and we have also connected with that. We have found Christian nationalists to be really amenable to conspiracy theories. And that shouldn't be surprising to you. I mean, they, they tend to, uh, I have some data right now that we haven't published yet that shows that, uh, you know, one of the, the leading indicators that you're a Christian nationalist is that you, you watch Fo Fox News and Breitbart exclusively. Like you distrust every other news source uh, except those two and Trump, right? So Trump, Fox News, Breitbart is kind of this wow. uh, source of information. And if that's where you're getting your information from, obviously you're going to buy into these kinds of everybody's coming after me and the whole world is against us uh, and we've got to fight to make sure it's ours. And so uh, that, that uh, enlightened me a little bit to how they could believe such an outlandish thing about atheists wanting to do them physical harm. Yeah, the unholy trinity of disinformation there. So uh, you're going to be yeah. looking at race uh, and how Christian nationalism impacts race more. Uh, you're going to be looking at what you were just talking about, which sounds fascinating, and how it might be tied to conspiracy theories. And I imagine, last question, 2020 is going to be taking up the next months of your lives, looking to see the impact of Christian nationalism. What are you watching for in the 2020 election in terms of Christian nationalism and its impact? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, one thing that I'm interested to find out is hopefully as we gather data, whether it's um, with some of our colleagues or polling firms, that they would ask at least one question or several questions having to do with whether Americans believe that Christianity should be privileged in the public sphere, kind of this idea of Christian nationalism. Because again, 
with exit polling or other surveys, even in 2016, where they would say it was, you know, just this religious group or religious Americans. Um, hopefully, we can be more precise as to what was really driving this. And so I hope that we see that. And then I think it'll be interesting to follow. Um, with both political parties, and we know Republicans will lean on this idea of defending Christianity in the United States, all of that. But it'll be interesting to see, too, with um, the Democrats, how they tap into a narrative of the United States and whether that will include religion in some sense or uh, if it won't. And and people look at 2016 and wonder, you know, should they have done more or less or, or what will happen? And so I think for us as scholars, it'll be really interesting to see whether they, um, you know, push on kind of this broader ideal or, or what they'll do. I mean, it, we don't know, but it'll be interesting to follow for sure. Yeah, I, I love what Andrew said. I affirm all of that, and I, I'd go even further. I'd just say I'd be to be more explicit. The whole white evangelical uh, uh, predicts everything category or trope is just not going to cut it this time, right? Like I think we've shown that. It breaks down a lot further than just being a white evangelical. It, it is an ideology, uh, this cultural framework that unites not just white evangelicals, but this whole group of culturally conservative Americans to say, this is why we support Trump. This is why we like him. This is why we're going to vote for him again. And and I think if if, if Biden and Harris can uh, can can hit the fringe of those accommodators, I think ambassadors are 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 really out, are are out to lunch on this, right? Like the ambassadors, the the, the true believers are going to vote for Trump no matter what he does. Uh, but I think we, we, we have the potential to see real movement among these accommodators who are close to the average, who are friendly towards Christian nationalism, but not real true believers. And I think if Biden and Harris can at least convince this movable population of Americans that, like, look, we, we value religious freedom. That's a good thing. Uh, we don't value institutionalizing this very specific set of, of identities and ideologies and, and things that this other group wants to wants to put in there. I mean, I think there's there's stands to be a lot of movement that we'd like to see happen. So that is what the two scholars, the leading scholars on Christian nationalism, are watching for in the 2020 election. I have to say, one of the things your work did was completely shift that white evangelical paradigm for me in terms of uh, electoral power, uh, and that was all because of the book. So go get a copy, "Taking America Back for God" today. Uh, you need to understand what's in here to understand what is happening in the country. And if you haven't joined FFRF, please do that today because we are on the front lines fighting. Christian nationalism. And thank you for joining us for our first ever Free Thought Matters after party. See you next time.